In this video, we'll go over 10 of the best uncommon magic items from official source books in D&D 5e. Generally, uncommon magic items come into play during tier 1 levels of play, which is around levels 1 to 4, and some of these being useful all the way into max level. And at number 10, we have the Bag of Holding. This is a non attunement item which just holds around 500 pounds of crap while only weighing 15 pounds no matter what's inside of it. In most games, you want at least one person to have a bag of holding so that you can store all the loot you get in dungeons or out in the open world, or just for a whole bunch of different occasions in which you might need to hold stuff in hammer space. It's just one of the most useful items you can have on you, and it's uncommon, so it definitely has to make this list, just because of its utility. Just make sure you never put a bag of holding inside a bag of holding, because then that causes it to explode and sends creatures to the astral plane. Now, the Bag of Holding does specify that there's only so much air inside of it, so you can't really store living creatures in there that need to breathe for very long, but that it's not impossible. So one useful thing you can do with the Bag of Holding is just have everyone in your party hold their breath, and then hide inside the Bag of Holding. Then have a druid wild shape into a mouse or a spider and just sneak into the final boss room, and you can basically skip an entire dungeon by just having everyone pop out with the druid wild shape dismissing. So there's lots of creative uses for this outside of just storing your equipment. Although it is very heavily advised to ask your DM before you try to do something so clever like the druid party trick. And at number 9 we have the Robe of Serpents. This is a robe from the Storm King's Thunder that requires attunement and has the potential to have up to 7 brightly colored snakes decorating the robe. And as a bonus action you can transform one of the serpents into an actual giant poisonous snake. The snake will move on your initiative and will attack hostile creatures for you. The snake only exists for one hour until it drops to zero hit points, or until you dismiss it as a free action. And here's the thing about the giant poisonous snake. It's one of the highest damage dealing low CR beasts in the game. And if you really wanted to, you could summon all of the beasts from this right before boss fight, and just completely destroy any encounter with all the giant poisonous snakes attacking during your turn as you actually don't use any of your actions to command them, just a bonus action in order to create them during combat. Although there is the big downside where the snakes do not return to the robes after their duration is up, so once you use all of them the robes are no longer useful. But if you treat it as a consumable item, it's incredibly powerful in the lower tiers of gameplay. Although there's a couple of other better items as we continue on this list that have more longevity. But when it comes to burst damage, you can't really beat the power of 7 giant poisonous snakes when it comes to low tiers of gameplay, because they can deal about 100 damage in turn on average, and nothing else really tops that when it comes to tier 1 damage output, and that's not even counting the damage your character deals during that turn as well. And at number 8 we have the Wand of Magic Missiles. This is the wand that allows you to spend one charge in order to cast a first level version of Magic Missiles. Magic Missiles allows you to create three dots that deal 1d4 plus 1 force damage each, and the great thing about Magic Missiles is that they can't miss. You can direct each dart to a different target. It has a 120 foot range, so you can hit three very far away targets if you want. So it's guaranteed damage, which is what's so good about Magic Missiles. There are so few things that do guaranteed damage in the game. And the great thing about the wand is that you can spend all of the charges to cast the spell to shoot even more missiles, as it will shoot an additional missile per higher level spell casting of it, and with 7 charges you can cast it up to the 6th level. The wand also regains 1d6 plus 1 of its charges per day, although if you spend all of its charges then there's a chance that it can crumble into dust if you fail a d20 roll and roll a 1. Now what makes the wand of magic missile so good is the fact that it does not require a attunement and is reusable. So the spell it's able to use is great for pretty much anyone since it doesn't scale or require attack rolls, so you can have a barbarian use it just as well as a wizard. And if you have multiple wands of magic missiles, you can kind of just swap between them. Generally you don't have multiples of magic items in normal campaigns, but that is something you can do since it doesn't have an attunement. So if you just had a bag full of wands of magic missiles, you could just cast a 6th level magic missile every turn without using any spell slots. And at number 7 we have the Insignia of the Claws. This is an item available from Horde of the Dragon Queen, which has the ability that while you're wearing the Insignia, you gain a plus 1 bonus to your attack and damage rolls that are made with unarmed strikes and natural weapons, which also counts those attacks as magical. 
which basically means if you're a druid, you gain the ability to have magical damage for your natural attacks, as all of your wild shape attacks are considered natural weapons. If you're a monk, it gives you early access to magical unarmed attacks, and it's the only item in the game which allows druids to gain magical damage for their attacks, so it's super useful for that. With the only downside being it's a magic item from one specific campaign, so there's a good chance you probably won't be able to pick it up. But it's an item so good that it's sought after by even high level adventurers, for the simple fact of turning natural weapons into magical ones for the purposes of overcoming resistances and immunities, which basically all high level CR monsters have. And at number 6, we have the Bag of Tricks. This is a bag which has a whole bunch of little fuzzy objects inside of it, and you can pick one out and throw it and it will turn into a random animal which is friendly to you and won't go away until the next day. Now the animal it turns into is random and determined by the color of the bag you have. All of the bags are uncommon quality, and of the bags, the tan bag is the best in terms of the highest chance of getting a good beast that can deal some decent damage. As when you throw the ball you have to roll a d8, and then you look at the table to see which animal you summon. All three of the bags have a chance to summon a normal CR0 critter which doesn't really deal very much damage, and isn't super useful for other things because it's just friendly to you and kind of follows your orders. However, there are a couple of really good ones it can turn into, like the gray bag has a chance to summon a giant elk, which is a CR2 creature that's gigantic and deals decent damage while having a great movement speed. And the great thing about the bag of tricks is that you can summon three beasts per day, each of the beasts lasts for a full day, and if you command them to just attack a single time, then they'll just do it for free every turn without requiring additional commands. The beast you summon with Maga Tricks is more useful than the beast summoned through the Beastmaster Ranger, and you can have three of them out at a time per day. Maga Tricks is kind of overpowered to an extent, if you get lucky with the three creatures you bring out per day. Like in the same bag which has a chance to summon the giant elk, you could also summon a weasel, which isn't as good. And there's a chance you could just summon three weasels that day, which don't really do any damage at all. Although you do need to use a bonus action to command each one to attack, so it might get tough to control in the middle of the battle, but as long as you have time to prep, you can kind of just tell all of them to attack before the fight starts. Or if you just throw the ball at an enemy target nearby, as you are able to throw it up 20 feet away, then it will just kind of attack whatever it lands in front of, since it comes out friendly and will attack appropriately depending on what type of animal it is. So if you throw it out and it turns into a lion, and it's friendly towards you and your party members, it's pretty reasonable to assume it will just attack whatever enemy is in front of it without you needing to give it a command. The only reason the Bag of Tricks isn't higher on this list is because it does have that random chance to give you kind of useless animals instead, and one of the Bag of Tricks has a one-third chance to only summon CR0 creatures, which don't really hit very hard. Although the Rust Bag of Tricks has a chance to summon a brown bear, which hits harder than everything else at that CR level. And at number 5, we have Staff of the Python. This is a staff which can only be used by a cleric, druid, or warlock, and what it does is turn into a giant constrictor snake, if you throw the staff on the floor and speed the command word as an action. The giant constrictor snake is a CR2 creature which has a very good constrict ability that can restrain a target and allow all of your party members to have advantage on whatever it's restraining. The snake also goes on its own turn in the initiative order, and you can even control it without using any of your actions. So this staff is also better than the beast from the Beastmaster Ranger. The snake also has 60 hit points, so it's pretty beefy at low levels, in fact, the Staff of Python is kind of overpowered at low levels, since a single giant constrictor snake will have more health than an entire party of adventurers at level 1 or 2. And as a bonus action, you can speak the command word to return the staff to its normal form, which will heal the snake to full health immediately. Then you can use an action just turn it back into a snake. So you could use every turn to heal it back up to full by just using a bonus action to convert it back into a staff, and then throw it back with an action to go back into combat. But there is one big downside to the staff, and that's if the snake dies by being reduced to zero hit points, it reverts to its staff form and then shatters and destroys itself. So you can't use it again if it dies a single time, which definitely makes it a risky choice to use in higher level campaigns. But in early levels, the staff of Python is straight broken. So much so that I've heard of some tables that ban it completely from tier one levels of play. It just adds an incredibly strong and useful creature to the turn order that's better than any early level tank. Although once you get to the higher levels, it's nowhere near as useful, and there's a good chance it will die before you have a chance to heal it back to full, since you do have to wait until your turn in order to use your bonus action to convert it back into a staff, and then put it back. 
Although uncommon magic items are kind of meant for early levels of play anyway, and within those confines, the Staff of Python is super good, and a majority of D&D games happen in early levels anyway. So, it's good in a majority of D&D games, which definitely puts it at a high spot on this list. And only above the Bag of Tricks, because you're guaranteed to get a CR2 creature from the Staff of Python, while the Bag of Tricks only has a chance to give you a CR2 creature when you use it. Although you get three tries per day, so it's a pretty good chance you get one of them that you want. And you don't have to worry about the Bag of Tricks destroying itself when they die. You just get three summons per day, every day, without really any downsides. And at number four, we have the Weapon of Warning. This can be a weapon of any type and requires attunement, and all the weapon does is warn you of danger. While you have the weapon on your person, you gain two benefits. One of them is advantage on your initiation roll, which is always a plus, and you and your companions cannot be surprised as long as they're within 30 feet of you. In addition to that, if you or your party are sleeping, the weapon will wake everyone up naturally when combat begins. So you don't have to worry about a nighttime attack completely destroying a sleeping party because you weren't able to wake them up in time. The weapon will just automatically wake everyone up the instant the first round of combat starts. The weapon of warning is so useful because you don't actually need to hold it to gain its benefits. You just need to be attuned to it and have it on you somewhere, and you get the ability to get a whole bunch of surprise random encounters while also gaining the ever-important advantage on initiation rolls, which is a pretty rare thing to get and is super useful in combat. Even if you never actually use the weapon for anything, it's just an incredibly useful weapon to have on one person in the party, kind of like the Bag of Holding, especially for the effect that wakes everyone up, as you no longer have to worry about someone sleeping through combat encounters that almost killed everyone in the middle of the night. Although. If you're playing a campaign where that never happens, or if you have a feature or ability that makes you not surprised, obviously not as useful, but an uncommon item which gives you all those benefits is super useful, and definitely deserves a high spot on this list. Although the next three are just way more useful. And at number three, we have the Headband of Intellect. While attuned to this item, your intelligence is treated as 19, unless your intelligence is 19 or higher. So it just sets one of your base stats to one away from the maximum, which is all kinds of broken if you're able to pick an uncommon item during character creation. If you're playing a wizard or another class which has intellect as their main stat, you could just dump all your stat points during the character creation process into everything else except intellect, and you would still be a very effective caster for a majority of the campaign. Once you get to the higher levels, you kind of want your best stat to be maxed out, but then again, most games don't go into the higher levels. The majority of D&D is played in the lower tiers. So you could grab this headband and just have it equipped for an entire campaign and it would never be a detriment. Although it's much more practically useful in long-term games if you want intellect as like a secondary stat. So that you don't have to worry too much if you have to lose the attunement for whatever reason. Although at low levels or during character creation, being able to nearly max out one of your stats is super good and it's kind of crazy that an item like this is uncommon quality. But then again, intellect is one of the least used stats, so I guess it kind of makes sense why this one is uncommon, and an item which increases your constitution to 19 is a rare quality. And at number two, we have the Gauntlets of Ogre Power. These increase your strength score to 19 while you're tuned to them, unless your strength score is 19 or higher without, so basically just like the Headband of Intellect, only for your strength score. And it's super useful for the exact same scenarios as the Headband of Intellect. If you're able to get it during character creation, you can just dump all your strength stat and still be an incredibly effective fighter if strength is your main stat for dealing damage. Although, an advantage it has over the Headband of Intellect is there are higher levels of this item in the game, and those are the Belts of Giant Strength. The Belt of Hill Giant Strength, which is a rare item, can set your strength score to 21, which is higher than the maximum. So you could reasonably expect to increase your strength score later on in the game with a stronger item, and just never put any points into your strength stat without worry. Assuming you're able to start with the Gauntlets of Ogre Power, and assuming you know you're able to obtain a Belt of Giant Strength, as there's a whole bunch of different ones at different rarities, with the best one giving you 29 strength. So with giving you a near max stat, and the option to upgrade it later, it's definitely one of the best uncommon magic items in the game. And it kind of makes sense that it's uncommon, since strength is also not a super power stat either. It's useful for classes that use strength, obviously, but it's not as universally useful as the other three stats. Dexterity, Constitution, and Charisma. That's why they don't have Dexterity or Charisma items that set those scores at 19. Those two stats are useful for every class in pretty much every game. And at number one, we have the Winged Boots. 
These boots do require attunement, but what they give you are up to 4 hours of fly speed per day, and you can use the 4 hours in bursts of 1 minute. Which basically means you just have a fly speed now, as long as you only use them in combat and don't overuse them outside of combat. But the boots are pretty generous with how they regain their speed. They regain 2 hours of their fly speed every 12 hours that they aren't in use. So as long as you get a rest day, or at least half a rest day, you don't really have to track how much time you have left in the boots if you only ever use them in combat or for short bursts outside of it. If you're trying to fly over long distances of the boots, then you might start having to keep track of how much of the duration you have left. Now, what's great about these boots is the fact that they essentially give you a flying speed for combat purposes without any kind of action or bonus action. You can just kind of activate them at will whenever you want as long as you have duration left in the boots. And it just gives you the fly speed equal to whatever your walking speed is. And the ability to fly is incredibly good. It kind of breaks a whole bunch of encounters a DM might have set up for you. Because you can just kind of fly over them or avoid any traps by just hovering out of their range. You can also completely avoid characters that don't have ranged attacks, which is almost every single beast in the game, and a lot of other monsters that just can't hit flying targets. There's a reason Adventure Leagues bans the use of the Arakoa race, because they gain the ability to fly naturally, which is kind of broken in combat. And you can gain this flying speed in combat with a single attunement slot and an uncommon item in the form of the winged boots. In fact, the fly speed they grant is so useful that these boots are even used in high tier levels of play. And a lot of people pick up the winged boots alongside their very rare or legendary items because they're just that good. The winged boots are a little bit too good, so they get banned a lot in tables. You really have to ask if you even have access to this item in the first place, because I can't imagine too many DMs willingly giving out a pair of these to someone trying to hunt them down specifically. Alright, and that's the list. There are a lot of really good uncommon items to the point where I kind of want to make another part of this video. But, if you know of any other uncommon magic items that are better than some of the ones I put on this list, I'd love to hear about them as well as ideas for future videos just like this one down in the comments.